Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Philosophical Research Society. How y'all doing tonight? All right. Uh, my name is Alex McDonald. I'm the Theater and Events Manager here at PRS, as well as a programmer. Uh, and I want to welcome you all here. Who is here for the first time tonight? Oh, wow. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So let me tell you a little bit about where you are. The Philosophical Research Society was founded in 1934 by a man named Manley Palmer Hall. He was a author, he was a lecturer, and he was a scholar of comparative philosophy and world religion, uh, as well as a mystical seeker of occult and esoteric knowledge. Uh, he uh, started his career as a Christian pastor and found that his congregants were asking questions of him that Christianity alone did not uh, provide answers for. Uh, he sailed around the world and studied world religions and came back uh, and at age 27 wrote this tome here, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, at 27, uh, which is considered to be one of the most quintessential um, metaphysical tomes for seekers of all sorts, um, comparing world religions and looking for one unifying truth that runs through all of them. Uh, initially, PRS was a traveling uh, 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 book club, essentially, uh, a traveling salon for discussion, and then realized that LA needed a cemented place for uh, all of this uh, uh, area of inquiry and uh, broke ground here in 1936. Um, from that point on, he would lecture on this stage weekly, just come on stage. We have the thrones that he sat in in the back, you can check them out afterwards. Right here, glass of water and a table, he would talk for 40 minutes uh, about world philosophy, uh, tie it into current events, uh, talk about um, analysis of ancient texts, um, and uh, all sorts of uh, really fascinating topics, not unlike what tonight's speaker will do right here on the stage. Uh, we have in that, since, that time since held classes, workshops, lectures. At one point, this was an accredited university. Uh, and we are now a 501c3 arts and culture nonprofit. Uh, we still do classes, lectures, workshops um, on philosophy, metaphysics, and the esoteric. But we've also sort of expanded our uh, programming to uh, look at what um, spiritual seeking is for many people today. People don't necessarily come to it through traditional means. It might be through music. It might be through film. Uh, and so we've expanded our programming to include that. Uh, I do want to share a little bit about some upcoming events that I think you might all be interested in. Uh, on the 30th of this month, we have a Zoom lecture, an initiated tour of the Western esoteric traditions, uh, which will be really, really fascinating. Uh, we have earlier in that week uh, a, a book release presentation, uh, Psychedelic Cults and Outlaw Churches, uh, I'm blanking, unfortunately, on the author of that book. It's cut off here. But um, that's a book that's really fascinating. It's about sort of during the countercultural movement when um, churches and religious organizations around the U.S. Uh, were granted uh, use of entheogenic drugs for holy sacrament. Uh, it's really, really fascinating. Uh, we have uh, Chris D. from uh, The Flesh Eaters and Divine Horsemen. Uh, we'll be here for a conversation on October 5th. Lydia Lunch will be here on October 19th to do a reading uh, from uh, her own personal writings. It's going to be really fantastic. Um, let's see, what else would you folks be interested in? We have a, a tour. This is really incredible. We have a private tour of a collection of a man named John Gaughan, G-A-U-G-H-A-N, uh, in Atwater Village, he has one of the greatest collections of automatons, so automated figures uh, reaching back into antiquity. Uh, the doors are rarely, rarely open. He is letting us go in. He's letting us bring only 50 people in. Uh, so tickets for that are going fast, uh, and I cannot recommend that enough. So that brings us to tonight. Uh, a little bit more on uh, Manly P. Hall as it relates to this evening. Um, 
PRS sits at the nexus of philosophy, religion, and science. And that last pillar is uh, was very important. Um, the implication that this knowledge was not static, that it evolved, that it grow, that it adapt. And part of Manley's philosophy, in fact, there's a really fantastic lecture called, I think it's just called My Philosophy of Life. You can find it on YouTube. If you're a record collector, there's actually a record on Discogs. It's very cool. And one of the things that he underlines in that is that um, he wants this knowledge to be accessible to all people. This is not something that's meant to be hidden away and kept to the precious few, the shrouded and the hooded. Um, and I feel that tonight's uh, presenter is very much in that tradition. One of the things that I really love about Mitch and his work is that uh, he, there's a profound sense of ethic, ethics that runs through the work. Uh, it's not, again, it's not static. There's consideration for social changes. There's consideration for social injustice and how these things, this knowledge can help to address that. Um, there's acknowledgement of places where certain uh, philosophies may have fallen short or need updating. Uh, and most of all, though, uh, there's a real dedication to taking this esoteric knowledge and by the Webster's Dictionary definition of esoteric, making it less esoteric, less hidden, more accessible, uh, because I really feel that he, he believes that this knowledge is liberating and can really, really help all people, humanity. So I want to welcome to the stage Mitch Horwitz. Uh, he is the writer in residence at the New York Public Library. He is a Penn Award winning author of books, including Occult America, One Simple Idea, The Miracle Club, Daydream Believer, Uncertain Places, and just released this week, Modern Occultism. Please welcome to the stage, Mitch Horowitz. Thank you. Someone asked if uh, the podium would block his view and I reassured him I'm quite hyper in my style of presentation. I'm a pacer. Um, Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Uh, there's a lot of old friends, a lot of new faces. I think some of you were here a couple of nights ago when uh, we had a dialogue up on the stage with artist Chet Czar, who's here tonight. And I want to do a shout out to him. Thank you for coming twice this week. And you can find Chet's amazing books in the bookstore. And if money is tight and you're deciding between his and mine by his for now, because it'll increase in value and you can be assured. Um, I just want to say a, a brief word of tribute uh, to the man who built this place, Manly P. Hall. Uh, like all of us in this room, he had a complicated life and career, but he did have an ideal of creating an ardently non-sectarian school for the learning of esoteric philosophy absolutely no affiliation, no membership required, no boxes to check. And it was accessible to anybody who felt like coming down. And uh, I have to say he succeeded wildly. I mean, we're able to gather here tonight and this place is, is full almost every night of the week. And it's just an extraordinary uh, legacy to the man. I, I think I'd be very, very hard pressed uh, to name another such school in the United States. There are some good places out there and some good growth centers, um, a couple non-affiliated, but very few that are just so accessible, including in an urban environment, which I think is important. Um, I got my start on this uh, stage, actually. In the summer of 2005, I was on the phone with a man named Obadiah Harris, now deceased, who was the president of PRS at that time. And he said to me, look, if you ever happen to be in the neighborhood, and I live in New York City, uh, our podium is open to you. And so I got off the phone and I determined right then and there to be in the neighborhood. And I showed up the following September and I gave a talk up on this stage called The Occult Philosophy in American Life. And the transcript of that talk formed the basis for my first book, Occult America. And I don't know if that would have occurred, again, without this kind of non-sectarian atmosphere where learning and ethical understanding, spiritual understanding, a pursuit of extra physical studies, I don't know that there's any other place uh, where you can do that in such a freestyle. 
And <clears throat> when I completed uh, Occult America, I went on from there to write some books that were practical in orientation and some books that were historic, historical in orientation and some that were a mixture of the two. I guess I'd have to say this one is historical in nature, but that being said, that being said, I think that you'll find within it some ideas that may help you within your own search, that may help you pursue whatever line of study it is that interests you. Because I'm very convinced that in the alternative spiritual culture today, we need to be especially careful not to fall into the groove of a conditioned thought, that is to say, of ideas that have been handed down for so many centuries that um, just by dint of familiarity, they seem as natural as the floor beneath our feet, and they seem to be determinants of reality. So this might entail speaking in these either or terms about what constitutes uh, spiritual practice or what coordinates we need to determine for that which is life-giving and positive and nurturing uh, versus that which is maleficent and draining. And we can get into very rote patterns of thought that serve to limit the questioning of the individual, that serve to limit our ideas of what the spiritual is. And by spiritual, I simply mean extra physical to a set of given parameters. And whether those parameters prove satisfying or not, we feel, well, I must be doing it wrong. And we just kind of rely on the try again school and we go back and we go back. And there may be some intrinsic value in that, but I also believe that the individual should be free to think and to experiment and to probe outside of any coordinates, but also self-responsible as well. And it seems to me that documenting history is a help in determining ourselves. You, you know, I could hold forth on why it's important to document the past in any number of ways that I think nobody would disagree with or find any, any objection with. But I'd like to attempt to go beyond that and note something that was said by the spiritual philosopher G.I. Gurdjieff, who I think was one of the most innovative, seismically challenging voices of the 20th century. And uh, Gurdjieff made this statement, the past controls the future, but the present controls the past. And that's the kind of statement that I think is always concealing of something because it's very simple. There's nothing roundabout in it. And it's not being spoken in a strictly metaphorical way. And I think that we as a human community have experienced enough in terms of human testimony across millennia and in terms of scientific protocol in our own era. And I don't use the term science in this kind of religious way, science is simply methodological replication. That's all it is. And it shouldn't be invoked as the tablets coming down from Mount Sinai. It's methodological replication. And it can be very, very important, obviously. And we've experienced such affirmation of a perceptual role in experience, a perceptual role in what concretely is felt and experienced around us from uh, bodily health to actual experiences, at least as a conceptual imperative, if one takes seriously the implications of findings in not only quantum physics, but a very wide range of fields, including controversial fields um, like parapsychology, which very often follow very strict and orthodox scientific protocols. But the field receives so much pushback simply because of its implications. And its implications are, in a sense, the ultimate sin of Western society, the ultimate sin 
so judged within Western society, which is that extra physical experience can be felt in our physicalist world. If J.B. Ryan had gone no further in his ESP experiments conducted at Duke University in the early 1930s, we would have sufficient statistical evidence to support that statement. We have reams of replicable, juried, bulletproof, non-polluted data that has been parsed up and down for decades that demonstrates the anomalous transfer of information between individuals in a laboratory setting. So when I speak of a statement like Gurdjieff's, it's more than just placing faith in the idea that perception is in some measure causative. It's much more than just a, a leap of supposition. It's a position that to deny would be denying decades and decades of evidence just in one slice of our organ of inquiry, which is lab-based evidence. So by understanding our past, I think we engage in more than gazing in a mirror and saying, oh, well, that's who I am, or that's where I came from. I think it's possible that by engaging with our past in a creative way, and in order, I think, for real creativity to occur, just as one of the trailers that we were watching was suggesting, after inspiration must come enormous sweat equity, enormous work. That's always proven the single most reliable, maybe not the only, but the single most reliable uh, venue to creativity. So I think we stand the possibility of interacting with our past collectively and individually in a way that may well prove transformative. So even in what I would have to say is a pretty strictly historical book, um, what I've just described is much more far out than I think what you'll find in the first 380 pages. And, uh, but there is nonetheless, I think, in an act of, of documentation, a level of engagement that might prove transformative in subtle but very deeply felt ways. We have historical amnesia uh, in the Western world towards very substantial parts of our culture. We in the Western world, and when I speak of the Western world, by the way, I'm not just talking about you know, the conventional iteration of, of Europe and its migratory and colonial offshoots, including the Americas, although that's certainly part of it. I think it has to be argued that the Western world culturally uh, includes the Middle East, Persia, North Africa in the form of ancient Egypt. And <clears throat> parts of Eurasia, areas that were at one time or another occupied by the armies of Alexander the Great, who basically created not only a spread of Hellenic culture, it, it, it must be said sometimes by the sword, not always, but his movement created an intermingling of, of uh, what we consider Western and, and Near Eastern cultures in a way that I think has to be included in what's called the West. So we in the West have experienced this historical amnesia where what we refer to in our society as alternative spirituality, or sometimes by different terms that fall under that umbrella, like the occult, we're referring to these things that are kind of off to the margins of society. A cult itself means hin hidden. And the great historical irony in this is that until schisms in late antiquity 
uh, gave rise to Christianity and then later Islam as dominant movements, the religious traditions and practices that populated the lives of men and women for millennia were polytheistic, seasonally based, often divinatory in orientation, encouraging of seeking relationships, some petitionary relationships, practical relationships with unseen energies, which they personified as deities, a feature of not only every culture in history, but every culture in prehistory, because we have sufficient evidence, though it is fragmentary, that the Neanderthal species itself had a spirituality that used talismans of uh, eagle talons and bear claws as aids in the hunt. And we in the modern world are in possession of these things that were named Venus figurines in the 19th century. And these were fertility statues that Neanderthal men and women crafted. And uh, it's like a figure with a big Buddha belly and a long head of hair. And we have hundreds of them. So the idea of petitioning and seeking relationships with unseen energies is not only as old as humanity itself, it's as old as pre-humanity. These are our primeval ancestors. And a talisman that you might be wearing around your neck right now, I'm wearing several, might possibly be recognizable to these figures. It's like, oh, I kind of know what that is. Like you recognize a spoon or something. This was the normative state of uh, the human species, certainly of peoples who occupied the Western world, as I've described it, for millennia. And as early Christendom uh, gained ascendance, of course, as with all conflicts of ideas, uh, it was able to brandish the old powers as some sort of evil or maleficent um, worshipers. And later in, in, I would say, into the modern era, these, these people were referred to as consorting with demons or demonic in nature. In its, in its original usage, in Greek, daimon or demon, meant a neutral spirit or entity. It was a neutral term. And our very language itself, this is sort of what I was referencing earlier about conditioned thought, our very language itself comes to rest on these concepts without considering the extent to which they're just conditioned. You know, do, do, you, do you have to engage in an approach to your search that somebody says you does says you do and if so you know where did that person's ideas come from what informs these strictures that we place even within our innermost thought experiments so early christendom was able to uh, define the remaining vestiges of nature-based, initiatory religious practices, seasonally-based religious practices um, as evil or maleficent or demonic, ways in which, of course, such practitioners never viewed themselves. But I must point out that had the pagan powers gained ascendancy, they would have persecuted the Christians just as the Christians did them. I mean, human nature is just that terrible. And... <laughs> It's not about, you know, waving a flag for my side, like, oh, you know, I really wanted the Temple of Jupiter to win this one. I mean, I did, but in all fairness, uh, it wasn't populated with better uh, people, less prone to uh, want to tell people what to do and kill them when they disagree. And in many cases, sadly, uh, that is the story of human nature. So... All of this material belonging to ancient religious systems 
and orders. Um, th there were very few ways to preserve any of it because stuff wasn't frequently getting written down. There was oral tradition, um, various initiations, dance, storytelling, parables that were passed on as, as teaching mechanisms and so forth. But it wasn't, it wasn't quite common that people would write things down. In many of the authors whose names we cite all the time from antiquity, Homer, Plato, um, the figure of Pythagoras himself, who was written about by his students, nothing was ever attributed to him. We don't necessarily know the vintage and the authenticity of these figures or whether they represented real actual entities. This is true in ancient Chinese literature as well. Um, we don't know the, the vintage or the personhood of uh, the author of the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu, or the author of the Art of War, Sun Tzu. You know, we use these names all the time, but sometimes these names were not invoked as bylines until centuries after um, the probable death of some of these figures themselves. People would append the names of other figures onto manuscripts in order to lend gravity to them, maybe somebody of reputation. And so in the decades immediately following the death of Christ in the city of Alexandria, which Cleopatra, <clears throat> who had died well more than 50 years earlier, uh, had made into a kind of revivalist project for Egyptian culture. Uh, the rulers of ancient Egypt uh, were Greek in lineage um, following the invasion uh, by Alexander in the fourth century BC. Um, and Cleopatra was as well. And the Greek ruling class even tended to intermarry uh, in order to preserve its bloodline. But very frequently, nonetheless, uh, they, they were Philo-Egyptian in nature. Um, some of the Greek rulers of ancient uh, Egypt called Ptolemies were devotees of Egyptian culture. And I would say perhaps none more so than Cleopatra. And she turned Alexandria into a real center of learning and culture and commerce and revived initiatory traditions. So, so much so that um, well over 50 years after her death, uh, Greek speaking uh, scribes living in the city of Alexandria began writing down ancient uh, Egyptian esotericism in a series of dialogues that came to be known as the Hermetic literature. Um, they ascribed the name of either Hermes, uh, the Greek god of intellect, or Hermes Trismegistus to their manuscripts. Hermes Trismegistus was a, a term in Greek meaning thrice greatest Hermes, which these Greek scribes applied to Thoth, the Egyptian god of learning. So as to say, he's three times as great as our own Hermes. And so these scribes affixed um, to this literature, uh, this name of Hermes Trismegistus, and various copies were made on papyrus scrolls. And this became uh, one of the few fragments of ancient Egyptian thought in an expository written form that came down to us in the modern era. And the Hermetic literature, which was rediscovered during the Renaissance, was considered possibly by Renaissance religious thinkers to be an example of some pristine primeval theology, some concept of human purpose and the cosmos that was older than anything that had ever been known or understood. And the Hermetic literature was greatly arousing to these Renaissance thinkers because it promulgated a universe, once again, in which the individual wasn't just seeking salvation, but was seeking actual growth, expansion. And although the word could scarcely be uttered, power. And it was a, a radical reach backwards to a primeval outlook that had been forgotten. There are vast tracts of Hermetica, but if I could 
center on a single meaningful idea within it. It's this, the belief that all of creation emanates from a life force that could be described as a great intellect, a great higher mind, which these hermetic writers refer to by the Greek term nous, and that nous created by thought figments through concentric circles of creation. And we live within one of these concentric circles of creation. And we are pretty far from that source of creation, that great higher mind. Hence, things can be dramatically terrible uh, within our sphere of existence. We live under all kinds of laws and forces. So the hermetic view, I think, couldn't be represented, including a force of thought causation. As we were created, so are we able to create through perception, through thought. And this informs the great hermetic dictum, as above, so below, that there exist correspondences in everything. It's the fundamental relationship of life on both a natural and an intimate personal scale. Correspondences complete. I think you find this echoed distantly in Western scripture in the line from Genesis, God created man in his own image. Again, as above, so below, thematically. Now, also in hermetic literature is an idea that the individual, the individual is actually greater than the gods, because while the gods are fixed in immortality, the individual is ever in the process of becoming, of becoming, which is considered a greater, more positive, more dynamic expression of life than a kind of fixed immortality possessed by the gods. So suddenly, here reintroduced in, during the early Renaissance to the Western mind is this idea that totally challenges Abrahamic religion, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, in which the goal is salvation. The emphasis on salvation being greater in Christianity and Islam than in Judaism, where it's better to remain in a state of perpetual guilt. Um, <laughs> say this on the eve of Yom Kippur, but <laughs> um, it's a direct challenge to the conception of salvation. The individual is not seeking salvation. The individual is seeking, ultimately, godhood, is passing through concentric circles of experience, possibly through eternal recurrence, although most of the hermetic literature is very vague on that topic and rarely references it. But the individual, in any case, is tasked with rising through these concentric circles closer to the source of creation and thereby coming to know his or her own identity as a creator. It's a total challenge to the basic Western conception of our physical and extra physical lives. And historians uh, and translators and religious scholars were trying to figure out what to call this ancient philosophy and other more technical variants of it, which involves spell casting and aspects of astrology, divination, alchemical processes what should we call this? And uh, the term uh, that was adapted from Latin, occultus, in English became occult, meaning uh, hidden or secret. And so there was a complete rediscovery at this time, at least among those people who had access to uh, books and learning, which was not many, sadly, but there was a complete rediscovery of 
a perspective and a window onto life and a philosophy of creation with actual practical hands-on practices that could be performed. And it was, it was a, a, a fragmentary iteration of a vast, vast culture spanning continents that was gone. Now, the Hermetic literature itself was so venerated that a lot of Renaissance scholars had this hope that as some sort of primeval theological statement, it was uniquely old, that it was written down maybe in the age of Moses or Abraham. And a philologist and, and linguist named Isaac Causabon, uh, who, who stood on the shoulders of some scholars who preceded him, uh, demonstrated in 1614 that this hermetic literature didn't date to late antiquity, didn't date, I'm sorry, to early antiquity, to primeval antiquity, but was a later expression that had followed the death of Christ. And his analysis was bulletproof. And because of this recontextualization of the literature, there was an impulse in Western culture to think not in terms of correspondences, which was the hermetic dictum, but to think in terms of opposites, which was the Aristotelian dictum. And thinking in terms of opposites, as soon as the hermetic literature was identified as being nowhere near as old as enthusiasts had hoped, the whole project of this rediscovered hermetic literature was a fraud. It was sullied. It, 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 it was just a, a, a kind of mirage. What was not understood at that time, and it's peculiar because um, other religious texts have been defended on the grounds that I'm about to cite, but this argument was never uh, lastingly mounted for the preservation of the Hermetica in Western culture. Almost all of human history, uh, as it's reached us, began in oral form. I was referencing earlier that we don't really know the individual personalities of these ancient authors who we cite all the time. And it's almost universally acknowledged that everything that got written down in antiquity, biblical or otherwise, was first conveyed in oral form. And it, it, it actually follows the development of the human species itself. Uh, a baby is born, and, and first, the baby's only way of communicating uh, is, through, is through crying. So it's, it's sound-based in nature. Later, it learns uh, to, to speak and has greater command of, of communication. And then eventually, uh, not too long after that, speaking begins to give way to writing. Human history develops the same way, as above, so below, correspondences. But although that concept, I'd say, is pretty universally accepted, um, it was never applied to the Hermetic literature. And there was never an inkling that this literature was the late expository version of oral philosophy that had extended back a possibly millennia, or aspects of it. There's no doubt, there's no doubt that Hermeticism also incorporates certain ideas that are contemporaneous to its writing, which is one of the ways in which, in which Kazaban was able to redate it. So the, the Hermetica sort of made testament to its own late antiquity in a certain way. But the people who wrote these ideas down, um, look, if they weren't writing based upon earlier oral tradition, then the Hermetica would be an exception uh, in, in all of ancient literature itself. But that argument uh, did not get lastingly made. And the Hermetica was all but forgotten about. Uh, there was exactly one English translation in the year 1651 
The Renaissance came a little bit later to England than it did to other parts of Europe. So sometimes they would dote upon things that we might regard as being kind of 90s or something at this point. And, um, and so, so the Hermetica received its first English translation. And for centuries, it was totally neglected. Uh, there were a few attempts uh, in the Victorian era translations. One, a monumental uh, three-volume effort by a writer named G.R.S. Mead, who was a secretary to Madame H.P. Blavatsky, who is on my shirt tonight. Um, not a brick in this place would stand if it wasn't for the influence of H.P. Uh, Blavatsky, I can tell you that, and Manley Hall, were he here, uh, would agree. Um, that being said, the Hermetic literature was so heavily neglected in translation that you will not find a single direct piece of Hermetic literature in Harvard's Loeb Classical Library, which is considered to be the, the great canon of Western classics, not a single, not a single direct piece of Hermetica. It wasn't until 1992 that Cambridge University Press released an English translation of some of the key Hermetic tracts uh, by a scholar named uh, Brian Copenhaver. And it's a monumental work of scholarship that was followed uh, in 2000 by another English translation by a man named Clement Salomon, who was working with a, a group of translators. Um, it's called The Way of Hermes and was published by Inner Traditions. And, and there have been some very, very creditable efforts since then. Very, very creditable. But dig this. I mean, ours is the first generation of English speakers that has access to this material. I mean, neglecting it would be like getting to, you know, invited to an Elvis concert in 1956 and being like, no, I think I'll stay home and, you know, listen to the radio. I mean, it really strikes me that we are in a very, very fortunate moment in terms of the search, and it should not be minimized, and it should not be squandered if you're, if you consider yourself a seeker. Um, we have, as I was saying, uh, the first really, truly sound, reliable, creditable, readable English translations of this hermetic literature in history. Um, we're also the beneficiaries of the discovery of the Gnostic Gospels uh, or at, at Nag Hammadi in Upper Egypt uh, in, in 1945, sh shortly before the end of World War II. And let me tell you, you know, Gnosticism did not get much more kind of respect in whatever passes for our culture of letters. Um, I would say maybe even well until the discovery of that Nag Hammadi library. And now you see Gnosticism, this notion that we live in a kind of simulacrum, uh, a, a, a kind of world that's imposed upon us. Uh, an airsats world, and only through the light of gnosis or thought. Gnosis, a Greek term that's etymologically related to nous, the hermetic term for great higher mind. Only through an act of gnosis or thought can we start to see the bars on our cage. Uh, the first 20 minutes of the Barbie movie are a Gnostic gospel. And I'm sitting there watching this thing, and I'm saying to myself, I don't know precisely what it is that generates an idea across an entire culture. But I doubt that if you were to lay out the basic Gnostic position to almost anybody in this country, and people who might disagree bitterly on a lot of shit, people in the vast majority would say, yeah, actually, I do feel that way. <laughs> I feel I'm being very seriously fucked with. And, you know, and I, I know it gets terribly emotional and these emotions are misdirected 
in all the wrong ways, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but there is a common feeling in this country, it may be the one damn thing that actually unites us, <laughs> that, that this world is not to our making as it ought to be. And as I've alluded, you know, it, it must be said that that, I'm not going to say it stems from, but it certainly parallels hermetic thought doesn't necessarily stem from, but certainly parallels Gnostic thought. And it's spread across our media, our culture. And, you know, still, uh, the occult is considered the domain of weirdos, you know, and, um, and you know, Loki, well, he's just this cute guy who makes jokes. And, you know, no one wants to peel the onion any further and say, what is it we're grooving to here, precisely? <laughs> But it is awfully interesting, this concept of there being an extra physical capacity to mind, in which I think warranted belief is, is, speaks for itself at this point in history. Um, there is something to be said for this, and it may very well be that we drink from some kind of common well water that doesn't fit within um, our conventional commonly observed uh, conceptions of cognition. And hence, you know, you've got people from Saudi Arabia, astonishingly, you know, to, to Los Angeles watching this movie and being like, yeah, there's something going on here. And it's very subtle. Um, so we have a, uh, unique accessibility, a big word, but I think a fair one. We have unique accessibility to hermetic and Gnostic literature. All we've got are fragments, but we have some, some choice fragments, I believe. And we're also experiencing uh, a kind of new unfolding in the study of astrology, both Vedic and Western. Uh, there's a, there are various projects underway, the most prominent of which is Project Hindsight, where scholars of astrology, independent people mostly, are translating astrological works that had previously been in Hellenic languages, Greek and Latin, into English. So we're getting new windows on astrology that are just extraordinary, and, and in some ways even very disrupting, because I sort of grew up liking my free astro chart and, uh, you know, relying upon the basic coordinates that have been practiced for centuries uh, in the West. But some of this new material is proving really challenging and is causing those of us who are interested in astrology, as I am, uh, to question whether uh, familiarity of system has become a barrier and whether we have to take a hard new look at things. And, I mean, this is a very serious path of inquiry that's probably going to give the next generation um, maybe a different looking astro a Western astrology um, than, than what, what we know today. So that's exciting. And uh, psychical research, parapsychological research has survived withering attacks, withering attacks to endure in uh, a handful of independent labs and college campuses. And, there is new lab work going on that's very exciting. I won't go into it in detail, but I write about it in Modern Occultism. I talk about the precognition experiments of uh, a Cornell research psychologist named Daryl Bem. And I waited uh, 10 years to write about Bem's experiments because they're so challenging and they're so extraordinary that it was, it was greatly beneficial to be able to see uh, whether they could be replicated. And Bem's findings were replicated uh, and rendered statistically confirmative in a, a meta-analysis that encompassed uh, 90 experiments, including the originals, uh, in uh, 33 different labs in 14 different nations. And the results proved confirmatory. And in short, what Bem found, and this is really, it's fucking mind-blowing, but only because um, were so conditioned. Uh, what Bem found is that 
actions that you take in the future and what we conceive of as the future can have a retrocausal effect uh, in what we perceive as the present. And it, it, it runs completely counter to our concepts of linearity, which are, of course, not absolute. And we've known that since Einstein's theories, which have since been proven, such as the, the commonly recited idea that an object moving at or near light speed uh, slows down in time from the perspective of the observer so that the individual on that spaceship uh, effectively doesn't age or ages very, very slowly. It's absolutely true. It's an absolute fact. Astronauts in our own era, while they're traveling nowhere near the velocity of light speed, actually demonstrate minute but measurable reductions in the aging process. Don't tell Big Pharma this, you know, there'll be no fucking end to it. But <laughs> the, the simple fact is, our concepts of linearity, although they're incredibly persuasive and, and probably very necessary for five sensory beings, they're not absolute. And BEM commits the ultimate sin that I was referring to earlier in Western culture, which is that he produces evidence for an effect within our physicalist world that goes outside of its borders. That's the ultimate sin. The great John Mack, um, the uh, researcher of UFO abductee phenomena at Harvard who died way too young, made the observation that in the Western world, we are willing to deal with religion or spirituality, call it what you will, on certain terms. It can be explored through theology, and we can have schools of theology on college campuses. It can be written about in poetry and parable and fiction. It can be confined within congregational structures that have a very uh, definite and fixed uh, liturgy. It can be spoken of in terms of psychological benefits. But any talk of actual extra physical phenomena empirically documented in our world is the ultimate sin, the ultimate transgression of the order of things regarding consensus Western thought. And yet, Bem bravely presents this evidence and presents bulletproof evidence for its replicability, provides for free at his own expense, uh, software and an instruction book that he gives to any researcher who asks for it. And he basically says to them, prove me wrong, which is exactly what you're supposed to do in science, methodological replication. And for this, for this, the man is absolutely pilloried as a purveyor of pseudoscience and you know, arguments that are, that are contrary to his position are, are promulgated with uh, mendacity. Um, the cases are too numerous to go into, but I do write about them in the book. And I feel the need to point out that people who embark on these experiments, however conservative and scrupulous they are, they open themselves to professional calumny and they have skin in the game in a way that um, too often we do not in, in our culture of, of anonymous shit talking on social media and such. You know, these are people who put themselves in the line of, of real significant professional fire, and there are very few people uh, to defend them. So, despite all the pushback, some of which I've described, at least in general terms, a parapsychology as a field. Is, is, is producing uh, important material. And I'm, I'm not even including field studies, uh, which, which are an area that I, I hope to write about more soon because I think um, I'm sort of very attached to the laboratory model. Uh, for all my strange beliefs, I, I have a very um, uh, ipso facto mind. And, and, and I, I like to consider evidence that I think is really hardcore and hard secured. Um, but I also want to be very clear that there's experiences in the field of precognitive dreams, crisis apparitions, um, legitimately 
possible cases of reincarnation uh, that, that have been studied with absolute clinical impeccability. So there's a lot of that going on as well. So it leads me to a place um, that, despite um, everything in me, uh, is actually rather hopeful. And the hopefulness is that I think, based on everything I've just described and something more that I'm about to talk about, I think we're on the precipice of a kind of third wave occult revival. And I used to really wave off talk of revival. Uh, I would always, like clockwork around Halloween, <laughs> we're getting close to that time of year, uh, get contacted by, by mainstream journalists who always had the question, like, is the occult getting more popular? And it's like, it's kind of, it's like, is music getting more popular? And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's an evergreen. You know, it's, it's an evergreen. Um, but I am seeing post-COVID, which maybe has something to do with it. I don't know. But I, I am seeing post-COVID um, a dramatic upswing in not only the developments that I've been describing, but contemporary books that are just of the highest quality. Uh, historians turning out books and ideas like the late Peter Lamborn Wilson writing Peacock Angel about uh, the Yazidis, a, uh, a sect of, of, of seekers in, in Persia that's subject to um, just hysterical um, calumny and oppression uh, because their religion is associated with a, a left-hand perspective. And that has to be parsed very, very carefully because um, this is a case where a liner brush needs to be used, you know, not a, a big house painting brush. But a book like that comes out and, and it's the last thing he wrote before he died. And, um, you know, suddenly we have a really legitimate Western window onto a, a group of people who, well, I do believe that they're part of the Western world in the sense that I was describing it earlier. Um, and they're being horribly persecuted. And there's, by the way, an organization called freeazidi.org if you want to donate something uh, to uh, the, the cause for, for human rights for this group. Um, you can also find it on, on my Twitter account. I, I'm frequently posting about it. Now, what I'm trying to say is um, we are experiencing all these different windows, uh, and they're happening simultaneously, and they're happening concurrently with another uh, important cultural trend, which is the mainstreaming of the UFO thesis. It's, it's absolutely extraordinary, I believe, how far we've come since 2017, when a series of articles uh, by Leslie Keen, Ralph Blumenthal, and Helene Cooper at the New York Times uh, broke open the news that the Pentagon had had a, a, a UFO-seeking program all along. And this idea that after Project Blue Book, everything was more or less dormant was a... Um, a, a fiction and that this program was in existence and uh, and that and some of the phenomena recorded by the program, but also elsewhere, uh, brought the UFO thesis into the mainstream in a way that I never thought we would see to the point where, you know, the Wall Street Journal is reporting uh, UFO wreckage being sought off coast of Alaska. And it's like, okay, and how are my stocks doing? And it, it's just extraordinary. The the change that we're seeing in this mainstream discussion, which is very unfinished. But um, one of the aspects of this discussion, and this is very, very important to keep in mind, and I write about this at the end of uh, Modern Occultism, is that in trying to have a discussion based on what we know uh, as to what these things are, obviously, you know, some vast number are just mistakes. Um, but for that remaining number that are not demonstrably uh, in error, for that remaining number, you know, we, we just have a handful of theses. And maybe our theses need to expand. But on the most conservative scale, it's, well, it's a secret weapons program. Okay, legitimate <laughs> hypothesis. Um, perhaps doesn't cover all the bases. So what else do we got? And then there's, you know, the ET thesis, of course. And there's another thesis that has been growing in popularity since it was introduced uh, by the computer scientist Jacques Vallée 
around 1969. There were probably some 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 figures who preceded Jock, just as there are always are someone's shoulders that we're standing on. But he popularized the idea that UFO phenomena might in fact be interdimensional in nature. And based on, I think, logical imperatives that grow out of uh, quantum mechanics, it's an absolute given, which I, I won't speak on in any detail right now. It's an absolute given that there exists something like um, inter diffuse intersections of time, infinite intersections of time, which we might call other dimensions. And we actually have better conceptual models, um, including variants of string theory, um, including uh, the Schrodinger's cat thought experiment, uh, including the many worlds theory coined by physicist Hugh Everett in 1958, we have, I believe, better conceptual models for um, a possible interdimensional origin of UFOs uh, than we do models for the extreme distance and velocity that would be required to venture interstellar travel. That's all. You know, it's not to say one is true, one is false, or that both can't be happening at once, or perhaps that neither are happening. But I think that, that that's an important consideration. And as we begin to struggle to put together puzzle pieces of the UFO phenomena, I think there is a conjoined conversation to be had, and that is occurring, that is occurring right now between students of uh, metaphysics, esoterica, the occult, uh, those who are interested in questions of extra physicality, and those who pursue the UFO thesis. I think there's a, a fantastic joining. Uh, in, in, in potential there, and, and it has already begun, and that is producing some very, very good dialogues and conversations. And as the UFO thesis just continues to take off like a freight train, again, who is to say what it is that takes an idea and that uh, makes it generative across an entire culture? As that thesis has grown in mainstream popularity, there are waves coming off of it that I think are fomenting some of this activity that I'm describing and that suggest why I'm talking in terms of a third wave occult revival. Uh, the first post-Renaissance revival being that instigated in the mid to late 19th century by Elipas Levi and Madam H.P. Blavatsky, and then another Woodstock era occult revival where there came a wave of popular material that we sometimes referred to as new age. And, and then there's our own time. And I have, I have stopped resisting uh, the possibility that we really are turning a very new page in occult studies for the reasons that I've cited. And I want to make this point very, very clearly. I don't have uh, an especially good track record in terms of determining, uh, predetermining popularity of, of something. Um, but so, so I don't have a, a great deal to say about whether there are greater numbers uh, coming to uh, the study of this really reconstructive project of primeval spirituality that we call the occult. I don't know whether the numbers are coming, but what's, I think, perhaps more important than that at this moment is that the quality is building. The quality is building. And the breadth of studies the quality of output, the quality of historicism, the seriousness of discussion and conversation, the learnedness of the people involved, it's getting better and better. So I believe that something is coming and I don't know what it is, but I ask you to watch for it very, very carefully during intense periods of history. And I think it's reasonably fair to say that we're living through one during intense periods of history, there are a lot of things that are experienced that we might call energies, uh, I'm speaking metaphorically, but there are changes that can be observed. Um, and I think we're just at the beginning of observing one. And uh, again, I can only ask you to watch it very, very carefully, because I think 
apropos of what I was describing earlier and, and why I believe the study of history is so important, it goes back to that statement that I quoted from G.I. Gurdjieff. The past controls the future, but the present controls the past. Never underestimate the extent to which you are interacting with circumstances in a causative, creative way that fueled the deepest ideals of our most ancient ancestors. And I thank you very much for being here. And I look forward to continuing with questions and exchange. Thank you. Um, I've been told that the best way to do this is foregoing formalities of setting up a microphone and we'll just do it by hand. So anybody has anything on their mind, please uh, just raise your hand. This is a first. I am waiting. <laughs> yes. Um, so hi, Mitch. Uh, I, you mentioned one of your books uh, that And there's a need for a theoretical, and I don't know if this it is goes well with what you're talking about, but there's a need for a theoretical framing of all these uh, ESP uh, data, and that it would be good if that people were engaging in, in, in creating the um, creating this theory to explain exactly what is how how is this happening to your awareness. Um, has any investigator uh, that has been engaged in meditation uh, research or psychedelics research, which is kind of trending now, do you know if anyone, uh, if, 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 do you know if this is happening some, somewhere? Is, is it happening, I think, more in the field of entheogens and psychedelics than it is in parapsychology? Um, and, you know, I, I, I had argued, I think, in Daydream Believer, that we really need, our culture really needs to reach for possible theories of um, extrasensory experience. And that we're, we're overdue at least making an effort in that direction. And I think that by participating with, um, I hate to use a pedantic term, but by participating in a multidisciplinary way in some of the some of the fields that I've been referencing, I think that, that possibilities start to arise for us to understand how some of these events may be occurring. And theories might be wrong, but at least that is a jumping off point from which to think bigger. And I think that's been. Yes. Um, so, Mitch, uh, and a lot of the new thought uh, gurus on YouTube, they present it as being very simple. And a lot of people, they try these methods of meditations, and it doesn't make they find it frustrating. And I, I just want to hear your general thoughts on like how it's presented and the effectiveness. And people for, like your message to people who are skeptical about the method if they struggle. Yeah, thank you. Um. I've always had a certain attraction to new thought because I'm really interested in the, in the simplification of spiritual practice. And part of the reason why I'm so committed to parapsychology, for example, is that I think if people can sustain the warranted belief, the informed uh, belief that the mind possesses extra physical capacities, it stands to reason that that uh, justly confident outlook m might help and might assist uh, in the um, exercise of these faculties. So I care really deeply about people having legit information that can help them make that decision. Um, I think that New Thought is right in its instincts about so much, but the promises are so sensationalized that... Um, that I think it, it really gives 
uh, the public um, a blanket that that is very very thinly woven and that is not necessarily going to uh, provide the warmth necessary when conditions get bad. And I tried to challenge New Thought on that. Um, that's kind of what Daydream Believer was about. And um, I don't want to uh, dismiss it because because I I that that wouldn't. I wouldn't be doing so sincerely. I really do feel that there's something there. And I'm very interested in the teachings of Neville Goddard, who was probably the most hermetic and Gnostic of all the new thought thinkers. Um, and I think his name will gain the greatest posterity of all of them. Uh, and I want to render things simple. So I like that instinct in new thought. And I know that it has elements of truth, but that truth needs to be leavened with the suffering of the human experience. And that has not yet happened. Yes. Um, in this past third wave, uh, what do you think that would possibly be a positive factor or moderate? Oh, I'm sorry. I just I hear able to speak a little louder. I think in this third wave, this perhaps third wave, you were saying maybe we should just carefully look and listen to see what's going to perhaps happen. What do you think the positive effects of moderate occultism? What do you think we should? Look out for or see. Just expressions in the culture. Uh, I mean, they might come to everybody in a different way at a different time. I mean, like I said, I had this semi-religious experience in the first 20 minutes of the Barbie movie because nobody was trying to lay a trip on me. But there it was. You know, I mean, that's the truth of the character's situation. And I thought, OK, something's like really happening here. Um, you know, if I may say, my partner Jacqueline Castell, who's here tonight, who's the film director, her new movie is called My Animal. It's brilliant. Please see it. Um, she, yes, premiered at Sundance. And, uh, um, and she's off to travel the world touring the movie um, at different festivals. Um, she's researching a project into esoteric uh, Egyptian spirituality and the precise thing the precise thing that she was looking for uh, uh, appears in a book in the library, an old Victorian text, and the pages had not been properly cut. So you ever get one of those books where it's like this loop and you can't see what's inside because no one has cut the pages? That's exactly uh, the, uh, the pages on which the information that she's seeking is being sought. So an archivist is going to properly cut the pages so there's no damage to the thing. And it's like, Okay, that's not weird. And um, I think we just need to be very watchful. And of course, we also have to know about cognitive biases because it's no joke that there is confirmation bias or survivor bias. The thing is, we can't turn those into these orthodoxies, you know, and that's what modern skepticism does. Uh, it's important to be reminded of these cognitive biases because I think they're real things. But to say that they cover every basis of life, so, you know, everyone from Lao Tzu to Jesus Christ to Sylvia Plath was just a, uh, you know, uh, uh, engaged in survivor bias of some kind, you know, or something. It, it's just, it's an injustice to the search. Um, and uh, there's a way in which these terms are used as mallets, you know, and they're just not being helpful anymore. Um, so one has to walk a, a kind of, a, you know, a balance beam of really being open and and also being scrutinizing and 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 taking seriously the the prospect that, you know, we don't want to create a belief system for ourselves. Um, I think that's another reason why I suppose historicism is important. I mean, like my, one of the debates in the writing of history today, and, and it's, it's an important debate, is the degree to which the lens of the, uh, the writer, the historical writer, uh, colors the nature of what's being seen. And, and it's a very legit debate, and I have no categorical um, solution to it. But I can say that in areas of belief, you know, I try to be very transparent that I'm a believing historian, that I participate in many of the movements that I write about. And, you know, people make these suppositions in our culture, uh, this looks like this, or this is connected to this, or something like that. And sometimes these suppositions might be grounded in some degree of good sense, but they're not enough, you know, in terms of the, the tools that I attempt uh, to use. You know, we really need concrete um, documentation, best as, best as we could find. 
doesn't close off other areas of inquiry. It's just the one that I choose to to exercise. So, you know, what I'm trying to say is I think that that we can afford to to make our best efforts at exercising intellectual excellence while also really acknowledging uh, that extraphysical questions are are urgent, I think, in our lives uh, to understand uh, who we are and what we're capable of uh, in the positive and negative. And um, I don't, I, I, I think, you know, we have to be very discriminating, but I think also at the same time, feel greatly liberated in, in, in walking this path. Yes. You've spoken in the past uh, against, uh, or critically, of conspiracy culture, and I think you've had good reasons for that. Um, but I heard you recently on a podcast interview, uh, it was a higher side uh, podcast, where the interviewer challenged you to reconsider um, conspiracy culture. And in light of the fact that you are currently taking on the UFO phenomenon and that the UFO phenomenon goes hand in hand with conspiracy culture because of the intelligence community's involvement, I'm wondering if you've given any more thought to reconsidering conspiracy culture. Um, well, thank you for that. You know, it's it's... For me, I made a commitment um, that I could just afford to be a little more flexible uh, in approaching certain things. I, I wouldn't say that my basic values have altered, and you know, you'll certainly see that on display in this book. Um, but at the same time, I, I was concerned that maybe a certain degree of obstinance was was feeding into my uh, my tone and my approach, and I think that. I think I need to be more flexible and uh, doesn't mean I've changed any of my basic values. And I have a critique of conspiracy culture. That's very, very serious. And, um, and that, 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 that is, is very familiar, you know, to those who know my work, but at the same time, I want to be careful that um, again, I was saying that when you're considering certain aspects of history, uh, you just got to use a liner brush and, and not, you know, a house paint brush. And I could afford to bring a line of brush to the conversation. Yeah. Yes. Mitch, have you ever thought, when you were talking about modern occultism, how the accessibility of some ancient literature is now contributing to our, our greater understanding of modern occultism, have you ever thought, as I have, of what, how far along we might have been if the Library of Alexandria had never worked? Yeah, it would, <laughs> it, it's an alternate universe, you know, which according to the artists at DC may exist somewhere. Um, but uh, the, the Library at Alexandria is a very interesting case. And I write about it somewhat briefly uh, in, in the book where, you know, it suffered a series of conflagrations. I mean, there were local chieftains fighting sometimes and it spilled over late in, history, late in antiquity. So there were a number of conflagrations that, that the library suffered, but, but it did suffer its ultimate destruction. And um, just as um, the Emperor Justinian closed the uh, uh, um, uh, Platonic Academy at Athens, um, you know, it was, it, was, it was roughly contemporaneous with the destruction of, uh, the final destruction of the library. And a lot of historians, I think rightly, uh, see the closure of the Platonic Academy as the end of, um, classical antiquity. Sure, you know, other events would play out, but uh, Elvis has left the building, you know, if I may. And, and, and there's a great sorrow to it. There's a great sorrow to it, uh, so far as I'm concerned. And, and it, it, within the hermetic literature itself, and I quote this um, in the book, uh, one, of the, one of the hermetic dialogues is referred to as Asclepius. And it's just an achingly beautiful dialogue um, in which um, Hermes is prophesizing uh, the end, but also the revival of Egyptian uh, civilization. And, uh, and he says to his student, uh, oh, Egypt, Egypt, um, your, 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 your greatness will be remembered only in fables, and those who venerate the gods will be deemed mad, and uh, those who turn away from uh, the search uh, will uh, be, be deemed great, and, and the whole world will be upside down. But it also prophesizes a return. Uh, so maybe these cycles, um, if they can be described as such, are necessary. Um, we go through these 
these terrible uh, losses, and yet they can be fortifying. You know, William Blake wrote, opposition is true friendship. That's why I don't want any of us to kind of waste a moment. Now, I'm rather hyper, admittedly, and uh, I'm, I do very poorly at relaxing. So it's sort of easy for me to say that. But I don't want any of us to waste a moment in availing ourselves of this, this cultural instance. Yes. Uh, I've heard you talk on a podcast before about your facility to um, abstain from the drugs and alcohol and other things that you've yeah, I mean, I'll go through periods of abstention. Um, I'm not currently doing that now. I drink, I take drugs, and I smoke. And, um, and <laughs> I mean, I try to abide transparency. Um, but there were periods of time where abstention was very important to me. In particular, there were periods of time where I needed to earn more money. And um, so abstention did uh, help me to do that. Uh, I'm sure I was physically healthier and um, more active. You know, there were positive qualities to it. Uh, at the same time, you know, <laughs> um, what was it Mark said? The ghosts of the past weigh like nightmares on the heads of the living. You know, income marching the old habits again. And uh, it is something that has to be managed. Um, but I think that it's a wonderful thing to, first of all, for some people, sobriety is a necessary way of life. And I'm enormously supportive of that. Um, and for some people, temporary sobriety provides a shift in perspective, and it can also have very positive benefits like earning more money. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. Imagine yourself sitting there on top of the crest of this third wave. How would you retrocausally affect this moment? <laughs> well, <laughs> wow. Um, I would have opened my water before I started taking questions, you know, but, but that's, it's sort of an unfairly glib, you know, response. Um, it's tricky. You know, we may have no choice in the matter. Most of the time we may be doing it constantly, uh, but unconsciously and sometimes for outcomes that, that are satisfying in our present experience and sometimes dissatisfying in as much as we're capable of, of affecting it. Uh, there might also be fixed coordinates that we're not, uh, able to affect at all. Um, the, well, the philosopher George Barclay is considered kind of the founder of idealism or perceptual based philosophy. He felt that there were certain fixed coordinates beyond which the individual couldn't go. And, you know, hermeticism, and this is a conundrum in new thought too, is, is everything subject to thought causation? Is this some mental super law? This is one of the reasons why I shy away from using the term law of attraction, because I think the connotation of a mental super law perhaps doesn't get at the complexities and difficulties of our lives. And I find a very a kind of um, reconciling philosophy within Hermeticism, because the idea is, yes, we do experience a vast complex of laws and forces, but that situation might be particular to this particular plane of reality that we experience and live within. In the hermetic framework, there are other planes of realities under which the individual might experience fewer laws and forces. So, you know, we might experience limitations in terms of retrocausal and causal abilities that are not an end to themselves of that philosophy or that probing, but just might reflect our current circumstances. Uh, but they're very real, you know, they're very real. So I wouldn't change anything, I suppose. Um, I, you know, it's like if I open my water, maybe like, you know, we would all be imprisoned by apes. And it's like Horowitz, you know, um, but, but I don't think I would change anything, you know, and, and I'm, I'm really just damn grateful that you're all here because to be able to do this uh, for a living is, is itself something that gave me a sense of um, stock. In, in causal thought, although that, that can occur over a very long bridge of incident, very long bridge of time. Um, but if you peel back the layers of your psyche to your earliest fantasies and memories, and I always ask people to do this, you know, that time maybe like at age three, when you began to formulate your first um, long-term memory experiences of cognition, what were your fantasies? You know, what did you dream about doing? Um, 
And you can stop and look back on that and find areas of just extraordinary correspondence in the positive or negative for what some of your earliest fantasies were and, and where you are now. This was a phenomena that de Goethe um, recognized and Ralph Waldo Emerson quoted him, I mean, somewhat paraphrased him really to the effect that um, what you wish for when you are very, very young will come upon you in waves uh, when you're old. So be careful. And you know, it's a very interesting concept, and it, 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 it kind of it plays in with the statement that I quoted earlier from Gurdjieff, and it's also a statement that many people immediately want to argue with. You know, I don't have this, and I don't have that, but it's a really worthy thought experiment because um, the, the, congruities, the co congruities can be just uh, extraordinary, um, but painful to acknowledge. You know? Anybody else? Yes. Hi, so I was actually kind of thinking about what you were saying about a third kind of adult revival. And I was actually kind of putting out kind of the idea of people like social media may or may not play it. Because I still use actively on social media as like a, I'm like probably the only Zoomer in this room right now. But I, like, there's a lot of like, there's been a big rise in like stuff like on TikTok, you have like Witch Talk and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And part of me is like seeing that as kind of like, I'm trying to figure out if I'm that's a good problem or a bad problem. So on one hand, it's good that it's more accessible. People are seeing this more often. But anyone can make an account on there. Anyone can post. Anyone can kind of share things. And not everything we share is necessarily accurate or helpful. And sometimes you get trapped in this kind of unhealthy fix of mind because of some stuff you saw that don't know because of the algorithm feeding you certain things. So I guess what I'm kind of trying to ask is to what extent do you think social media is a tool that will Oh, mm. That's a great question. I mean, I, I wonder all the time about the effects of social media. And, uh, you know, it occurred to me, never has there been a time in human history when so many voices have been in competition uh, to be heard over, over electronic media. Um, and the, 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 just the sheer number of voices that are sort of um, striving to capture people's attention are literally unprecedented in human history. Um, and it probably makes people do things uh, in order to get attention uh, that are sometimes sensationalistic or negative or based on uh, humiliating uh, another person or something like that. Um, and, and I think that these, uh, these temptations, you know, are, are perhaps overwhelming for some people because they have one single channel through which they can reach a mass audience and they kind of learn how to work that channel and sometimes they are willing to pay the price of dishonor uh in order to to reach people and other times you know as you're suggesting it's just a more innocent casual lack of background in something but you know why not broadcast my thoughts on tuesday morning all over the world um I, i've always and i'm I, I might be on the wrong side of this argument you know i really really might be um, but quite frankly, uh, I've always been left a little cold by the people who ask, um, you know, what, what's my view on occultism and technology and how they interact. And I, I feel like there's a, a richer, deeper well water that perhaps I'm not drinking from, but I believe so, uh, firmly in the constancy of human nature, um, that whatever pipes it's passing through are going to, you know, th the same stuff is still inside. And so I, <clears throat> I, I, I don't think that this occult, this third wave occult revival, if it's occurring, I don't think it's occurring precisely because of social media, but I do think that it, it, it certainly has been aided um, by expanded commerce available over digital media. I think that's helped. But even that, I don't want to overstate because the quality of the work, you know, really has to be there. And there are certain people, sometimes within academia, but very often independent, um, they're just doing extraordinary work. And I think that that's the name of the game. You know, that's what's really going down, in my view. Anybody else? Yes, we'll be the last one. Based on that comment about the social media, it really does demand so much more discernment. As you were mentioning earlier about, you know, uh, the answering the question about conspiracy theory mm -hmm. and then the idea of discernment and i think that it makes uh, especially 
people who don't like reading and going back. One of the things I really admire about is going back to original sources and, and following trains of thought. And I think that when you look at the you know buffet that's on social media, I mean, it, some of it is just so outlandish, and the level of discernment has to really be turned up. I, I agree. I agree. And I think our success or failure as a human community hinges on that very thing that you're describing. Uh, we will not make it as a human community if we do not approach social media in a discerning civil way. And um, that doesn't mean that uh, everybody has to have some sort of shared preferences or anything remotely like that. But there has to be some elevation of interaction on social media or, uh, you know, especially in terms of the way people talk to one another, the humiliation the routine sarcasm, the rhetorical questions is just everyday interaction. Um, we're not built to put up with this. You know, we're not built to put up with this level of anxiety, this level of uh, contest all the time. Uh, so our, our collective future, I think, hinges on that very thing. Yeah. Um, so thank you all. I'm going to be out in the lobby to sign books. If the bookstore runs out, I have, and I'll be out there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.